Bless you all. So glad to be here. Excited for tonight. Devil's getting a black eye. At least. Hopefully more. Everybody do your reading. What's the topic tonight? Basic trust. Good deal. Good deal. It's a good start. Um, I gave you uh, handouts at the desk there because I gave them to you last week, but we didn't get to cover them because I ran out of time. So I'd like to do that uh, because it's a theme. Both these things are themes. I'm looking at the one that says process of transformation. And then on the back of that, it's uh, called the angle scale, although it doesn't say that on there. But the back of that page, let's go there first, okay? The one that says, uh, we are called. See it? Can't hear you. Thank you. We are called in Christ to share with men and women, personally and collectively, the good news of God's kingdom, right? You agree? That's part of our calling. Now, if we remember, there's a wonderful saying, some things are caught and some things are taught. So people will catch a lot of Jesus in you, and they're watching very closely. So this is we're called to do this. Personally, individually, so, and collectively as a church, we're called to collectively tell the good news of the kingdom. We're sent to call them to enter into his new order of life through faith in Christ and his gospel. At the same time, we're sent to proclaim in word and deed the good news of this new life, I'm sorry, new order of life in the multitudinous structures of society, family, government, business, neighborhood, religion, education. In doing so, we must stand as Christ did in solidarity with the poor and oppressed, not a vertical versus horizontal emphasis, Got it? Oh, I skipped ahead, sorry. Further, we must engage actively in their struggle for life and fulfillment. There are no dichotomies. It's not vertical versus horizontal, not a redemption versus humanization, but a holistic vision of God's mission to the world and the church's role in it. Okay, I know that's a mouthful, but we have to realize that we're not just here taking up space till Jesus comes back to get us. <laughs> we're missionaries everywhere you go. You're a carrier of the Spirit of God. And there's antenna up that we have as Christians that are tuned in to what the Lord is wanting to say to us because he's a good dad, right? And he's always speaking. And there are times when you don't always feel like you're hearing him clearly, but it's not because he's not speaking. It's that we have to get the condition of our spirit tuned in to the right frequency so that we're hearing his voice. And everything that we do every day is a potential opportunity for the Lord to speak through us. What this chart does is... I actually got it through Peter Wagner. It's from Fuller Theological Seminary. One of the professors that was there while he was teaching the doctoral students, he actually was there for over 30 years. This man's name is James Engel. And, and one of the books he wrote is called What's Gone Wrong with the Harvest? Okay, and basically the idea that a lot of Christians can go for years and years without ever leading anyone to the Lord because it's not conscious on their mind and they're afraid of offending people. And that's clearly true in our culture today. But one of the keys that he found was that he, he calls it this scale, and, and that part of that antenna being up uh, towards the Lord is when you meet somebody, the Lord will speak to you about them. The most obvious way would be you'd get a prophetic word for them. And you might say something like, hey, you know, I'm a Christian, and uh, what, sometimes God will just give me an impression about somebody that I'm meeting with. Are you struggling with whatever? You know, fill in the blank, whatever that word is. You want to speak it in, in plain English, and many times... That won't even be the first thing you'll say. You'll just be talking to people, and, and, and something will come up, and they'll start telling you things that they don't normally tell people. Have you ever had that happen? They'll say things like, I don't know why I'm telling you this. I just met you, but I feel like I could trust you. See, that's the Lord, and that's a great sign that your antenna are tuned in to the right place. The problem that has happened sometimes when we think about reaching out to people is that we know one way to do it, and it's called the Roman road, Right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and then there's a bunch of steps, and that's fine. That's a great thing to do. But we also want to be active listeners to what's happening in the moment from what the person's saying to us, but also what God is saying to us about the person. That takes some work, doesn't it? And don't be looking at your phone while you're doing that. You know, it's kind of insulting to people while they're trying to tell you something that you're checking how many likes you got on Facebook or whatever else, right? It's really rude, don't you think? And it's really hard to listen to what they're saying to you at the same time you're listening to what God's saying to you about them. That takes your full attention. And I find that people really appreciate it when you listen to them. 
One of the ways they know that you're listening is because five minutes into the conversation, you pivot off of something that they said to you right in that conversation because you weren't so busy worried about what you were going to say, you were listening to what they were saying. And now you're responsive. And that builds a lot of trust with people because they can tell you're authentic and that you really care about what they think and what they're saying. What this idea is in, in witnessing would be, I meet somebody and I can tell early on that they're a little bit hostile towards the idea about God. And they say, what do you do? And I say, well, I work on Wall Street, but I'm also a pastor. I founded a church. And you can tell a little uh, ice gets on, on the conversation. And they say, oh, I was hurt in church, or my mother left many years ago, whatever. They got offended by someone. There are many reasons why they could have been hurt. So on this scale, that would be a minus eight at the top where it says man's response. You see that little chart in the middle? And what does it say on the left side? General, see that? General revelation. And they have an awareness on the right side there. It says they have an awareness of a supreme being, but no effective knowledge of the gospel. This is true more and more today than it ever was. When I was younger, most of the people I knew went to church and had a basic knowledge of the, of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They had watched movies when they were kids, King of Kings. You know, at Easter time, they would know some of the basics. Today, more and more you find people have no clue what you're talking about, right? I think I told you. So, uh, somebody had that stick, bumper sticker on the back of the car, I work for a Jewish carpenter. Somebody came up in the mall and said, oh, could I have your card because I need some work done on my house. And the guy's like, what are you talking about? He said, oh, I saw you have a bumper sticker. You work for a Jewish carpenter. And he said, you don't know what that means? He's talking about Jesus. They're, they're, it's just further and further away from their mind. So now drop down to minus one, okay? What does it say there? They're, they're at repentance and faith in Christ. So all these steps are just measures closer. As you move down from a minus 8 to a minus 7, 6, 5, 4, all the way down to 1 is when they, when they make the decision. So our job, you see the communicator's role there next to God's role? At the beginning, God's role is just to make himself uh, aware, make these people aware that he exists. And we, we know that from Romans, right, where it says all creation knows about God just through creation alone. So people are without excuse to think that there's no creator behind all this creation. That's the general summary of that verse. So God is the one that makes himself known. He said he would pour out a spirit on all flesh, not just Christian flesh. So there's a seed inside of people that has a hunger to want to know the truth. And, and once you can get past that God role, now it's, now it's the Holy Spirit bringing conviction on God's side. But what we do is proclaim. And a great way to proclaim the good news is to tell your story. Give a testimony. When you give a testimony, we talked about this a little bit on, on Sunday, the, the, the fact that David had sinned and God sent an angel as a punishment to destroy the city of Jerusalem. But when the angel got over this threshing floor that this man owned, he, God told the angel to stop. Anybody remember this? Were you here Sunday? And it was the exact same place that Abraham had offered Isaac up. So there was an altar there. And that's a testimony. See, that spot had a testimony on it. And it's talked about throughout the New Testament about what a great man of faith Abraham was for doing that. He took this promise of God and he offered it up because it was value to him. And we read from Hebrews later in the service Sunday that it said that part of why his faith was so great is that he believed that even if he had sacrificed his son, God had the ability to raise him from the dead. Right? Like, that's the kind of faith that you want to have. So as you're talking to this person at a minus seven, they're closer, but they're really not close prospectively to minus one, are they? So you want to talk about real life things and, and real practical. You're probably not quoting about Melchizedek at that point, right? Or, or they'll, <laughs> they'll think you're in the twilight zone, right? That's a deeper truth. It's a wonderful truth. But you're not going into Jesus in the order of Melchizedek right then. You're talking about how God set you free, that you had problems and you tried all these other things and, and God set you free. And they're like, really? I know. I mean, I know guys in AA and that's Christian base and they, they, they stopped drinking. But, but what about this? And what about that? And those are called, uh, the, they're objections, but it's because they're interested. And that's a really good sign. And you don't want to rush. You want to let people talk and you want to you know, let them gripe a little bit about what they didn't like, right? And, and the idea is it's not moving from a minus seven necessarily right to a minus one, let's say the prayer. You have to be really alert to what's happening in that conversation, but you want to keep moving them closer. Because I doubt everybody, and I doubt there might be even anybody in here who the very first time you heard it and it was presented to you, you said yes. 
Is that true? One guy in the back. Well, kind of. Really, I know your story because you told me. It, the seed had been planted in there, but it wasn't until 9-11 that you actually. So there was still a percolation that happened. Or like a germination, you could say. The seed was there, but the birth didn't happen yet. And that's a crucial thing about life is that you don't, you don't have to say, oh, I didn't get them to say the prayer because if you got them closer to God, you got them on the right path, right? I'm not using that as an excuse not to say the prayer, but if you go too quickly on this thing, you know, it could, it could blow up on you because you're, you're not being aware of what God wants you to do. So it's really on his, you know, he's the one that brings the conviction. Uh, if you read The Cross and the Switchblade, this is like a classic book. I just talked to somebody never even heard of it, and I was really surprised. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Nikki Cruz and David Wilkerson in New York City. Do you remember the story of Nikki Cruz's testimony? David Wilkerson was witnessing and witnessing, and Nikki kept threatening him, and he said, I'm going to cut you into a thousand pieces. Remember? And David, David Wilkerson said, yep. And every one of those thousand pieces would tell you that Jesus loves you, Nikki. And then there's a scene in the movie where he's laying in bed and he can't get that out of his brain. Like, oh my God, he's picturing a thousand pieces saying, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. And he was really mad at David Wilkerson because he didn't get much sleep that night. But it was really God, right, that was bringing the conviction. But now look on the other side of the cross. You're also in a process of growth in Christ. So just because they said yes, and I'll use Bob Dylan as an example because he's from my era, he was a very, very well-known, famous songwriter and singer, and he didn't have a great voice, but he knew how to write great songs, and everybody else would do his songs, and he got saved. So he's at this plus one now. He's doing a post-decision evaluation, right? And part of you is very happy after you become a Christian, but then you start thinking, well, what are the consequences of this decision that I've made, and especially him, very, like, world-famous guy, who is now writing beautiful songs about Christ. His first album that he put out was a classic. You're going to have to serve somebody. Anybody remember that one? That was off that album. And uh, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody, right? How powerful changing people's view of things. But because this post-decision process didn't work well, he kind of got rushed and he, and he wasn't discipled properly. He slipped back and went back to the world in a relatively short amount of time. That's a shame. And it's not a shame because we want to be selfish and say, look at how God could have used them. It's because of his soul that, that slipped back to the world, right? And we know that sower in the seed and, you know, how the birds will come and try to steal that seed or it falls on hard ground. So just because the person said the prayer, boy, you see that follow-up cultivation piece? Crucial to be able to know, let people know that it wasn't another notch in your gun that you got them to say a prayer, right? But translate this idea that everybody you meet is somewhere in a process. And one of the ways God wants to speak to us, and, and one of the reasons I believe that when the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they received language that they had never been taught. See, the symbolism there is God loves the people around you so much, he'll give you their language without you having to do any effort. He'll effortlessly, effortlessly put your, their affluency in you to be able to speak to them in a way that penetrates through that, that grid that they have of protection. Because, we're, frankly, you know, New York City, they're suspicious of everything around here, right? So they think you have an angle. They think you want their money or, or whatever it is. Then they'll bring up Jimmy Swaggart or, you know, whoever, Jim Baker, blah, blah, blah. But what about that? Yeah, okay, I know, but you can't throw Jesus out with the bathwater here, right? Not everybody who serves him is a perfect person, but that's kind of an excuse on your part. What about the truth of what Jesus said? Why is he the most influential man who ever lived? Because there's truth in what he said. And that's okay if he could keep it very relational. I guess that's my main thing is God wants to give you the right tenor and tone and words and facial expressions and everything because he loves them. And if he speaks through you, you have to give him control of you, right? You're submitting your will to his will. Because oftentimes when you're speaking to an unsafe person, what they do is a little bit of a repulsive, like they'll, they'll tell you some of the things they're doing. And part of you just wants to cringe and say, oh, but, but with God, you'll get empathy for them. 
And you'll say, oh, man, God's going to set you free, and you're not going to have to be bound by this thing anymore, right? Instead of, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with you, I feel defiled, right? So now take it out of the context of just witnessing to somebody and trying to lead them to the Lord and just regular conversations. Don't you think that you could use this grid the same way? Based on politics, you, you could be talking about politics, and if somebody's really hostile with you about the upcoming election, which certainly is in the air, isn't it? Well, how, what's your approach? Are you going to take the time to learn their side of the argument? You, you're not going to agree with their side of the argument necessarily, but you could show them the respect of at least doing your homework to know what they believe, right? And then if you're going to try to convince them, you disarm the hostility when you could say, yes, I understand that point. I've considered that, but, but have you considered this? And all of a sudden, a lot of that anger and a lot of that tone just starts to drop and say, well, no, I never really looked at it that way. And, and that's really what God is looking for in all of our relationships, and that's where we should shine, right? The greatest title you can have in the kingdom is servant. So I, I love this little story. One of the men that I, I love to listen to. I never got to meet him, but he was a partner with Peter Wagner, and I, I knew Peter Wagner really well, and Peter and Doris Wagner worked closely with John Wimber. And he was a musician, and he kind of, you know, he, he was not, he never took himself too seriously, which tends to be the case with musicians. And he would be a big conference speaker. He wrote books, best-selling books. One of his books actually was named one of the top 100 books of the 1900s, of, of the 20th century, and by a big Christian publisher. For a guy who was doing drugs and, you know, his life could have easily gone down the chute the wrong way. And he would go to speak at a conference and they would say, well, what title do you want us to use? Do you want pastor, John Wimber, or apostle, or prophet? He said, how about epistle? <laughs> right? You know the scripture there, right? That we, we live our lives as open epistles read by all men. Like, what a convicting thing to say. But somebody who had really thought it through and realized that it's not about the title, it's about the anointing. And, and you, you'll carry the anointing the more you're like Jesus. And this is very much like Jesus right here. He met people right where they were at. And, and that's why I want to con continue to use this picture for you that you're not ranking people on a scale. You're finding where they are on certain things. And, and it's a very high-level gift. And you have to love what God loves. And he loves people. So our communication skills, our listening skills are really important to God, and he'll use them multitudinous different ways, right? Including in the business world, including, right, you know, like just in the normal interaction with the people that you're with all the time, this should cause light to come out of you. You with me? Yeah. All right, so flip it over. And, and this is what I like to just remind people that, that this class and this series of classes that we're doing in the books that the Sanfords read, uh, wrote, I'm sorry, that we're reading is a process. And if you ever, anybody here uh, learn a musical instrument when you were growing up? And you know that's a process, right? You get a book and you get workbook one. And it might take six months to go every week. You're taking lessons and there's a lot of tears on those piano keys while you're trying to learn that yellow book. And that's the first one. And, and you're just grinding over this, and you're, you're telling your mother you hate this, and I don't want to do it. But then you start to get a little better at it, and you get to book two, and you get humbled again. And your, your teacher comes, and they show you the lesson, and they're going, oh, it's easy, watch. You know, and it's like, that doesn't look easy to me at all. But you do it. You submit yourself to the process, and there's pain involved. And if you bail on that process, you could say, well, it just wasn't meant for me. Or if you try to push through, that's all we ask, right? It's try to push through. If it's not for you, that's okay. But you may like it. You just have to get through that really uncomfortable part where you feel like you're failing. Similar process here, okay? None of us lived a perfect life. None of us are perfect people. We've all had things happen to us that we didn't like and we couldn't control and probably had an impact on us. But each one of our stories are different. But the Bible is so powerful that it covers everything. It covers the whole process, okay? So whatever you need is in there and whatever I need is in there. It's just when we do it together like this, we throw out the concepts and then we try to see where it applies. And a lot of the powerful time that we have here is at the altar afterwards, right? Because you've been meditating, hopefully, you've been meditating on what you're reading and what you're hearing, going back and watching the video on YouTube, and all of a sudden you get these little 
ideas coming up in your brain and memories that happen that you hadn't thought about in a long time. And that could be like that piano lesson. Like, oh man, I remember that and it's painful. And I bailed on a process somewhere in my background, right? So if you just look at this, it, it's one of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18 at the top. It says, we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are what? Being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory. That's the goal of the Christian right there. That we are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. We never fully arrive there. Okay? Because he was sinless. And just because we're Christian, we don't ever say we're sinless. But we're, we're, we're aspiring to be like him. I don't want to say striving because striving implies that, that performance orientation idea, right? But the aspiration is this right here, this, this wonderful role of being the servant king. And that plays itself out in every different dimension of my life. So on the left-hand side of this chart below, it says a language learner. And on the right-hand side, it says how Christians are transformed in Christ. Okay, it's right out of that verse, 2 Corinthians 3.18. We are being transformed into his image. Okay, this is a challenge that you have to accept. Because if you grew up in a mindset that said, no, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, there's not a whole lot I can do between now and when he comes back because I'm a, I'm a flawed person and I just hope he comes back soon because I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> See, that's not occupying until he comes, is it? No, that's just evacuation mindset. I want to get out of here. But he says, no, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. They don't evacuate. When, when the battle is going on, there's a man named Eleazar in the Old Testament, and it says he stood there. He was one of David's mighty men. And even when his comrades, his soldiers that were with him, the Israelites, started to retreat, he stood his ground. And he, and he killed the enemy, and, and Israel won because of his bravery. He was so engaged in the battle that his hand froze to the sword. Do you remember that story? So that's the picture we want to look at, like, okay, that's what it means to fully engage with what he's asking us to do. But that means I have to look in the mirror and be honest with myself. Okay, Lord, what are you showing me? That's what we've been talking about on Sundays for the last few weeks is this altar, our own personal altar. We bring things that we value, but he may not think are so important. And we say, I offer this up to you like Abraham offered up his son Isaac out of obedience to you. If there's something in my life that's slowing me down, that's become an idol, I don't want it. And as you go through this process, those things will start to surface. And now it's up to us. In that moment of truth, when it would be easy to retreat, we stand our ground. Okay? You with me? So let's just compare these two. And if you've learned a foreign language, you know what they're talking about. You don't hear the mistakes in stage one. It's very kind of just mechanical and rote. You're limited. You have limited ability to take in new information. You learn the basic language patterns and the sound systems and what they call a survival vocabulary, and the instructor corrects only mistakes which hinder the message, okay? So you're really just taking this by faith. They're telling me I should listen to these sounds and try to repeat these sounds, but I'm really just kind of getting the muscles in my mouth ready to make these different sounds, <laughs> but I really don't know what's going on. Then there's a transition. Before you get to stage two, you start to hear your mistakes. See that? Begin to hear your mistakes. You know the rules and the pronunciations, but the structures aren't stable. And you speak, but the accurate production is hit and miss. The instructor encourages the learner to just stay immersed, even when all senses are assailed and nothing makes sense. Now, I could put my guitar on and show you what it's like to learn your guitar. I'm not going to do that, but you'll, you'll probably relate. It's very similar, because that's like another language. And you, you'll do scales because you're just trying to get your fingers to have muscle memory and how you change chords and some of the songs require a lot of dexterity in order to play them and to change. But it's not just your left hand with the chords, it's your right hand because Latin music has one rhythm, gospel music has another, uh, rock and roll has another whole rhythm. So the right hand is, a, is an instrument in, unto itself. Then you have to learn how to play with your left and your right and sing. Smoke starts coming out because it's a, uh, ah. Oh, Sing and play at the same time and read the chords and the words at the same time. And it, you know, that's that transition to stage two. Like, okay, you feel tremendous frustration and you're tempted to quit due to limited production. 
you record yourself and then you listen to it and you say, whoever told me this was a good idea, right? But it's a necessary part of the process. You'll be awkward for a while, but you have to get through the awkward piece and kind of swallow your pride a little bit and say, look, Rome wasn't built in a day, you know how they say? And this, under normal conditions with a language, could take five years to become fluid in a foreign language, okay? So why are we beating ourselves up? No, as long as I'm doing the blocking and tackling, we would say in a football analogy, right? Keep to the basics, keep doing. It's not practice makes perfect, it's perfect practice makes perfect is the way I like to say it, is that because you could be practicing the wrong things too, couldn't you? And then you develop bad habits. Let's go to the transition to stage three. We'll still stay with the language. It says you develop by degrees clear pronunciation, stable structure, and adequate vocabulary with less and less need for concentration. And you can self-correct with relative ease. That's the transition to stage three. I think I jumped two, didn't I? No, no, I did. Okay. So then you get to stage three, which is called what? Fluency. Now, again, I'll just... I think I said this last week, but if, if you're bilingual, Manny, were, were you raised with Spanish? Okay, raised with English, but you'll know Spanish? Understand, okay. Anybody here fluent in two languages? Okay. All right, Victor, what, what's your, what, what are the two? India, okay. Uh, an Indian native language and English. And was English your second language? Okay, fifth. So I gotta pick on the guy that has five languages, right? So here's what I'm trying to get at. What they tell me, and, and what I could relate to similarly on an instrument, is in the beginning you're translating it from your native tongue to the new language, right? And that's a process that is a delay because that's why they have interpreters. At, uh, when, you, when, you, when you hear somebody, that's, the speaker might be a Spanish speaker, South American, and they'll have an English, and there's that, there's that lag there, right? So, but when you become fluent, what they say is you stop thinking in your native tongue to translate it. You can think in both languages. And, and sometimes you'll see at a conference, the interpreter will say, we don't have a word for that, right? right? And that's pretty amazing, isn't it? But we don't know how to say that because we would say it this way, right? Well, here's the deal. As we're Christians now, because we're going to go to the right side, this is, this is our standard of fluency. But when we're in the world, that's our native language. So we don't always know what to say because we're still translating what we think the Bible would want us to do in whatever situa situation we're in. That's why memorizing Scripture is so powerful because it's like muscle memory. When you come into a situation, you can withdraw on the deposit of the word that you've made in your heart, and you can apply it to each situation, because the more you do it, the better you'll get at it, right? Just like anything else. Who through reason of use, the Bible says, those muscles get exercised, and you become better at it. So let's think about this process that we're in, which is this transformation of what you got so used to for most of your life, and, and many times when you go back to your hometown and you're with your relatives for a while, you could get reinforced in the wrong stuff if they're not Christians. Fair point? Memories, back to your house, seeing pictures from when you were kids, and all of these things that were from almost like a different life because you weren't a Christian then. And you're there to be a light, but you don't want to slip, right? You don't want to regress and go back into a sinful lifestyle. So it's a stage one. I don't recognize the mistakes and the sins that I'm involved with, and I don't comprehend the wounds in me that are driving the hurtful life patterns. I may not discern patterns of behavior or thoughts or feelings. The counselor is careful to reveal only what the person needs in order to begin healing and doesn't overload. Now think about what I said before this side. I was on the other side. That's diagnosing where this person's at. And not overloading when you're talking to them, being sensitive to what Holy Spirit's saying. You don't want to try to give them a seven-course meal if all they want is the hors d'oeuvres in the beginning because they're just attempting to listen to this. But the same for yourself because some people come into this and things start to get stirred up and they say, oh, my God, I can't deal with that. I, don't have, I just don't have the bandwidth right now. I'm not in a place emotionally where I can go there because it's stirring up too many things. Well, that's, that would be a mistake on our part, right? We're not asking you to do that. We're just saying, by faith, 
Listen to what we tell you to listen to. Read what we tell you to read. Keep a journal. Write down what the Lord is showing you. He'll give you clues along the way of the different things where there could be holes and, and patterns that developed. And sometimes you only have three of the clues, and you really need five or six before you'll, you'll see the clear picture. But trust the process is, is, is what we're saying. So, like, if you're dealing with somebody who's newly saved and they are on a construction site and they're 40 years old and they've been cursing since they're eight, right? You think that's just going to stop immediately? Probably not. But you're going to call them out on it and, and, and rail against them and, and criticize them about that. You, you remind them we're going to get to a point where you won't want to do that anymore, but they're just not there yet, right? Next one, transition to stage two. You see the wounds and you begin to understand the destructive life patterns but you don't have the power to stop the behavior, <laughs> okay? So now the Lord is starting to reveal to you what happened to you and why you're doing these things, but that's all. You could just observe them. You don't know how to stop that behavior, but at least you're aware of it because you can't solve a problem if you don't know there is a problem. So this is powerful but a little scary because you, know, you now know it's wrong, but you don't have the power yet to stop it. God does, right? We have to trust that one. Next, able to explore problems with direction. The counselor will comfort the person, but also gently encourage the person to stay with the process, even though the issues are not clear and it seems like it's too much. Stage two, I feel frustrated and overwhelmed and I'm tempted to what? Stop. <laughs> I'm tempted to stop due to the struggles with doing the right thing, battles with impatience over the time the process is taking, feelings of stupidity and rebellion or guilt over the stress that's putting it on my family and friends. And this is the most difficult stage of healing in this transformation into Christ, okay? Because now you have enough knowledge, but you also see that I have a pretty big mountain to climb here, that I really did do a lot of harm to people, and there are a lot of amends that I should go back and make and apologies that I should say. But look, here's the deal. It's going to be painful either way. <laughs> if I don't deal with it, I'm going to live with the pain. If I at least try to deal with it and trust God to get me through it, I'll come out the other side stronger, and I won't keep repeating all that destructive behavior, right? So in some ways, the longer you went with the bad behavior, you could think it's harder to change, but not really, because... God just has this wonderful combination to break open the lock and get you out of that prison cell and move you forward because he loves you. And it's not all about just understanding. You're not a better Christian if you have a higher IQ, okay? It's not based on your IQ. Most of the people he picked were, were regular guys. They weren't big scholars. Paul was a big scholar, but I don't think Peter was. Right? And Peter, God used Peter mightily. So this idea that we have in our culture where the people with more degrees, oh, they're, they're, they're somehow superior? No, because they have bigger devils to deal with. They've got pride devils and all this other stuff that they're dealing with, okay? So you don't have to compare yourself to anybody. I'm here. This is my turn in life. I got put here for a reason, and I'm not letting the devil hold me back. I have a calling. There's a plan in my life, and things happen to me that are trying to slow me down, but they don't compare greater is he in me than what the world tried to put on me and what sin in the world tried to put on me, okay? And I'm not going to live in condemnation over past mistakes that I made. No, I'm forgiven. I'm a new creation. I'm not perfect, but I'm moving forward, not going back. Don't you love that song? I'm not going back. I'm moving ahead. You make all things new. That's the tagline there. Transition to stage three. This is when you start to feel like you've come over the top of the hill and it's getting a little easier now because you've got more disciplines in your life. It becomes, you become increasingly familiar with new and appropriate disciplines and you develop the ability to stop bad behavior what? After. <laughs> so at least you can stop, but it's only after you've done it. It's not the ideal goal yet, is it? Because we're not to fluency yet, but at least you can apologize. You can say, oh, I'm really trying hard to control my mouth, but I lost my my temper there and, and it slipped out, please forgive me because I really, that's one example, that's probably not even the best example. It's judging people. It's judging a book by the cover and being totally wrong and, and thinking that you know something and then finding out you were way off on something, right? Well, God is saying, uh, I'll develop a patience on the inside of you that you won't jump to conclusions. When you think you know the rest of the story, wait and get a little bit more information. That takes a lot of spiritual discipline. 
in many ways, because it seems like we have this ability to catastrophize. Have you ever heard that expression? So you'll be watching a movie, and, and everything will be going great. They're, the family's driving down the highway, and the, the, they have the Christmas carols on, and the kids are in the back seat, and mom and dad are in the front, and they're looking over at each other. And most of us think, there's a truck coming any minute now that's going to crash. This can't last, right? It's terrible, but it's the way life treats us. Or if you get a phone call from somebody that says, hey, we need to meet. Like, what's the first thing you think? It's not good, right? Because they would have said, hey, how's it going, blah, blah, blah. And then, they, and then you meet with them. This just happened to me today. And he's like, I really feel bad. I had to meet with you because I really feel bad about the way I spoke yesterday. And I, and I want to make sure you're OK with with me and, and that I didn't embarrass you with what I said. I'm like, what are you kidding? No, no problem. But the initial thought I had was, uh-oh, there's a problem. And I did something wrong. See, does, you don't have to do that. In, that. in that interim between when they say, we need to meet, and you actually meet, don't catastrophize. <laughs> Trust in the Lord. He's got it. You can't change it by worrying anyway. Right. You ever see the movie The Bridge of Spies with Tom Hanks? Remember the guy? The attorney's looking at the guy who's on trial for spying, and he says, like, aren't you worried if you go back to Russia that you're going to be in big trouble? And he looks at it and he goes, would it help? <laughs> right? <laughs> Worry. Would it help? <laughs> like four different times he says it, and it's so true. It's a biblical truth. You know, be anxious for nothing. If the guy's upset with you, deal with it when you get there, but don't assume, don't fill in the blank with a negative answer already. See, that's, that's really what's happening in stage three. You're realizing I'm not just a victim of a bigger conspiracy against me. I was, co I was contributing to part of those problems by the way I was responding, but if I could just keep my heart open and trust God, well, I, now I recognize I did something wrong, but only, until, only after it happened, but at least I can go apologize now. And then you get to, to fluency in Christ, which I've already said tonight, will never fully be completely transformed exactly like Christ, because he never sinned. But that's our goal. That's what we're aspiring to. And that's why every day we get on our knees and we start the day saying, I can do nothing without you, Lord. Right? I, I want to be interdependent with you. So we're going to talk tonight about basic trust and, and the need. What the, what the book says is independence, but we want you to think interdependence with God. Because independence could be a rebellious spirit, right? We're, we're, our goal is really not to be independent, but we also don't want to be codependent. <laughs> Throwing all these phrases out, right? Jack Frost came here many years ago. He gave us a great definition for codependent. Two ticks, no dog. <laughs> you get it? Isn't that a perfect picture of two people just sucking the life out of each other? There, there's no redemptive quality about that relationship. But that's what people do to their kids sometimes. The parents, because they don't want to be left alone, they'll try to make their child dependent on them. And they'll lay a guilt trip on them. And, and this is really unhealthy and not, not a godly thing to do. The Bible says a man and woman should leave their mother and father and cleave. Leave and cleave. And, and all these in-law jokes, if you Google in-law jokes on the internet, it'll take you years to read them all because there's so much hostility around this issue where the parents are overbearing and they're, and they're interfering in, 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 in what is really a sovereign relationship between a husband and wife. And, and as the parents, if you love your kids, you're not going to be overbearing. You want to be involved in their lives, but not to where you're smothering them, right? So that's, that's just out of respect. But it's sometimes hard for the for the son or daughter to completely leave their parents because of that guilt trip. But look, here's what the standard is. And it says that we submit to one another. Husbands and wives submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives love your husband, but husbands love your wives the way Christ loved the church. So when there's an, an interference of, of an in-law that's unhealthy, we have to address that because you have to leave and cleave in, in a really clean way. So that's really what the whole basic trust message is about. And we're going to talk about the right way that it should happen, what typically goes wrong, and then what we can do to correct it. Are you good? Yeah. You all look like you're still awake. Two minutes to eight. <laughs> I'd just like to show you the books that, that are part of this process. And um, if you could just, yeah, there you go. So we, we read the first book on the bottom of this pile, 
uh, during the first semester when we did those eight classes. Now you're not getting a book to read because the topics that we're using are covered in different books and we didn't want you to have to buy three books. So we're just basically sending you reading material by email every week, which is why we need your email. And if people are watching online, go online to our website, send us an email, uh, your email address, and we'll include you. All right, so these are all good books. So I'm not saying don't buy them, but we're just not using one for this semester. And then we can jump to uh, what we've already covered and what we're covering. So that slide that has the class list on it. So we've already done the first one, which is healing relational brokenness. Tonight is basic trust. And then you could see all the other topics. So there'll be another six classes after tonight. Why we need your email, right? Because we want you to read during the week. And, and then um, when we come, we'll, we'll be more prepared, okay? And I, I just find if you can make it part of your devotions and you can include some of that reading and looking up the scriptures that they're referencing, when we do meet, it'll make more sense. You won't be hearing it for the first time when you're here. And, and that's just a, a, a principle that when you invest in something, you get a dividend. And when you put your time into something and you're really a diligent seeker, God rewards you for that, for that willingness to say, I'm not happy with where I'm at right now, God, and, and that doesn't mean um, I'm not uh, grateful for where I'm at, but I want to remain restless and hungry in a good way. I want to grow more. I want to be more like you. There's further I can go to be transformed into, into the image of Christ, right? That's, that's a goal that will be for the rest of our lives. So that next uh, slide says, what is basic trust? And I'm trying to give you some of the language from the reading uh, because they were counselors for 25 years, they read the Elijah House Ministries, John and Paula Sanford. They got a lot of training, and they always kept it through the Christian lens. But then there's just stages of human development that all people go through. You could get dropped off in the South Pacific somewhere, and, and these are human beings, and they all go through similar stages of growth. It's the way we develop as people, right? So this says human growth requires certain accomplishments. And this lesson will discuss the stages of development each of us must go through, as well as the tasks associated with them. So on that second handout you got tonight, you see this little chart? And there's five le levels. So this is the developmental process at a high, uh, a high level of understanding. These are the five stages that people go to before they leave the home typically and start out on their own, if we could say it that way, right? So you don't, it wouldn't be good if as a parent, you want your child living in the basement until they're 50 years old, right? They're not your kids, by the way, they're God's kids, right? So we have a stewardship over their lives and to make them codependent on us would not be a godly way to raise them. We want to raise them so they can stand on their own two feet, but to understand that they need God in that process. And that's why I say independent is probably not the right word we want to use. It's interdependent. Standing as an individual, which they'll use this phrase to individuate, you individuate where you can make your own decisions, stand on your own two feet. You don't have to run back to mommy and daddy and ask, how should I handle this situation? Because you have your own complex way of solving problems, but you're in a good, healthy relationship with your parents. You go to them for advice. I'm thrilled that our kids still do that. I'm, I'm really happy about that. And that, that's a sign of a healthy relationship because they want to hear what you have to say and they value your advice. But if you're overbearing with that, not, to, not so good, right? So we're talking about the very bottom level. Basic trust is the very first thing that people have to go through. On the left side of that chart, it says developmental age. And on the right side, it says chronological age. So they're saying there's five stages you'll go through on the left. And on the right, it's saying it's typically done in these ages. So zero to two, complete dependency, right? That, that infant can do nothing on their own. They would die if they weren't being taken care of. You have to feed them, change them. They're, they're, they're basically helpless and defenseless without people around. That's not true of other animals, right? When a horse gets born, it's up and running like 10 minutes after it comes out of the womb, right? We, are, we have this long period of time where we're completely dependent, but we are also dependent in those other stages too to be in a healthy environment. Now, some people, unfortunately, between 6 and 12 are forced to have to try to live like an adult, right, if, uh, under certain conditions. So that's that's a crazy system because the way we're designed to grow up is to be able to help, have a healthy way to go through these stages. 
So we're dependent on the people that are helping us, but we don't want to be codependent, right? We want to be interdependent and then go out on our own, but still realize we're not really on our own because only a fool would say in his heart there is no God. And I don't want to be a fool. I want to recognize that I need God. It's not a crutch. No, it's a battleship that helps me get through life to be in relationship with God. Okay, so good with that? It says independence. I want to say interdependence, so sue me if you don't like that. I don't know. This lesson will discuss the stages. I said that. And then because these stages are sequential as well as successive, that sounds a little technical. It just means they have to be done in order. That's the sequential part. But successive means if you don't get it right the first time, going to the second phase doesn't solve that problem. You're still going to go, have to go back and get that problem from stage one solved, even as an adult, okay? And that's what we're here for. That's really what we're here for. And you could say, it wasn't my fault what happened to me when I was two years old. That's true. But it's a consequence that you're dealing with now as an adult. And, and we have this wonderful, unfair advantage of Holy Spirit, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Word of God, truth, counselors who love you and have no agenda. You can come as many times as you want as long as, you know, it's not that we just want to pander to people's problems. If you're doing the work we're asking you to do and you're coming here for ministry, keep coming back. It's the same price, zero, <laughs> right? Because we want you to change. We want you to grow. We want you to overcome the things the enemy's trying to use against you. And, and with God's help mostly, but sometimes a human vessel is very valuable in that process, especially when they have a gift for the pro prophetic because God will speak through them to you. And then you have somebody with skin on that you can actually talk to, who, you, a shoulder you can cry on. And sometimes you'll feel like you're, you're chugging along behind that piano and I'm not getting anywhere. And then boom, you get a breakthrough. And then you jump, you jump up much higher than where you were. And you feel that, and that, that helps you build momentum. Like, wow, I've got a victory over something. I got free from something that was holding me back. There might be five more things I still have to deal with, but once you get victory over one, you realize this is doable now. And now you, you, you take on a whole new vigilance about that. All right, so they're sequential and successive. So healthy and timely growth requires that children learn them in the proper order. And you could go back and you could think about, you know, as I was growing up, I remember, the, the story of Romeo and Juliet. Let's just think of that one for a minute. Everybody familiar with that one? It's kind of a world classic. And the issue is that the parents want some say in who their child is going to marry, right? And, and one of the first things that they should care about is what kind of family does this person come from, right? And you used to think, well, that's kind of snobbish, isn't it? But then you realize it matters a lot. To be raised in a good family is a great help. It's not a guarantee of anything, but it's really nice if you could live in that ideal world where you got a lot of love and affection and both parents were on the scene and, and very um, encouraging to you and, and helping you, disciplining you when you needed it all the way through each of those stages. What a gift that is. And if you had that, and some of you I know did have that, that's awesome. Uh, our youth pastor, I would say, is one of those people, David Torres. Doesn't mean he's perfect, but both parents were very engaged. They were Christians. They didn't overdo it and, and just, you know, over religious uh, doctrine where he, he was turned off to it. He, he wasn't serving the Lord the whole way, but there was a great grounding in there so that when God touched him, he was ready to jump back in again. And, you know, unfortunately, we didn't all have that. But, but we have this, okay? We have Father God. And he's way better than earthly father, earthly mother, as hard as they may have tried. So that's the great equalizer, right? This is this great unfair advantage, no matter what the problem is. If you listen to Joyce Meyer, you'll be shocked at the trauma that she had to live through with her father. And, and here she is impacting millions of people around the world. In the natural, you'd say there's no way anything good could have ever come out of her background. And I'm going to ask you in this class to watch her testimony. And it's not easy to watch. You, you'll want a box of tissues nearby, but it's important that you watch it because no matter what our problem is, God's bigger than the problem. We can overcome that thing. We don't always know the clear path on how we're going to get there, but we trust him that we will get there. All right. So let's go to the next slide, please. It says basic trust is first and foremost of the developmental accomplishment. So those five stages, basic trust is at the bottom. Failure to acquire basic trust 
affects us throughout our adult lives and impacts our ability to relate to God and to other people. The developmental year, which is a means of measuring developmental accomplishments, which we were at those five, may occur from six months to three years. And that's on that right side of that chart. In the early years, you might, you might get it at one year old, might be two. It, there's no right answer. It's just that you get it. It's that you get that basic trust to move you into that next level where you have to go, OK? And we're not going to go into all the detail on that. But it's important that you realize you will graduate from one level to the next. And, and it's, it's called individuation, OK? Even, even from zero to two, you individuate there, and then you move to two to four uh, you know, in that chronological, chronological age, but even in the stages. And you can think about this. We'll, we'll actually give some examples. I think the next one actually has it. It says, let the reader, can we get to that one? In the first developmental year uh, of a child's life, basic trust is either gained or it isn't, <laughs> OK? So if it, if it doesn't get formed well, you still have to go with kids that are two to four years old, and you, you might have a crack in your foundation, OK? But what is it? It's the capacity to hold your heart open, to risk sustained heart-to-heart -heart involvement with imperfect people. Now that means everybody, because everybody's imperfect. So whoever you're asked to be in relationship with, there are going to be flaws with them, right? So don't ask God for perfect people. They don't exist. But ask God to help you deal with the imperfect people. And look, I love the language. A capacity to hold my heart open and to risk sustained heart-to-heart -heart involvement, even though I know they have the chance of hurting me, and probably will. But as I gain the space of trust, I can start to learn to trust the process and get the tools that I need not to let that ruin the relationship, OK? Inner strength and resilience, and then the capacity to remain vulnerable. Now, it's important not to think of vulnerable as weak, OK? It's not defenseless, although that is a definition of the word vulnerable would be in battle. You could say if somebody's vulnerable, it means that they're, they're exposed and that they could get killed. No, we're saying I'm keeping my heart open on purpose. I'm allowing myself to be vulnerable, even though I know you have the ability to hurt me, but I'm not shutting myself down just to keep you out from hurting me because then I pay another price is that I have to live behind a wall in a cage, and I don't want to live in that cage. So that's not so easy, is it? because we don't like to be hurt. But I'll remain, uh, having strong basic trust gives me the capacity to remain vulnerable to people who can't always be believed. I did that chart already. And I like this one. It says, from, a moment, uh, from the moment of birth. Can you get that one? Good. All right. And by the way, you got the slides last week? Everybody get the slides? If we have your email address, you'll get these slides. You don't have to take pictures and, and the handouts, and you get next week's reading, all right? So just try to listen. A baby enters a pilgrimage from dependence to independence. Now, I said enter, right? So just get the point there. As Christians, we aspire to interdependence with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we mature within the body of Christ. So it's one of the other necessities. We need to be in the body of Christ. If I'm a Christian and all I'd ever do is sit home and watch stuff on the internet and I'm not connected with other Christians, I'm lacking a major resource of the kingdom, which is to live life together and to get prayed for and to be in corporate worship and, and not isolate because I got hurt. I want to engage. I want to keep my heart open. Even though that's vulnerable and I could be taken advantage of, I'm going to risk it because the power of being together as the body of Christ is priceless. That's what Jesus said. The gates of hell will not prevail against my church. OK, we need to be together. In the womb, a fetus is totally encased and dependent upon the mother and father, really, because the father's helping keep a stable home, hopefully, in the traditional roles that people have. And at birth, a baby becomes his or her own organic entity. This is the language of the Sanfords, OK? If the newborn's body doesn't function independently from the mom, the child may not survive. Right? They were completely dependent on mom in the womb, and now they come out into this risky thing called life. And I don't have my mom, I don't have a direct connection to the umbilical cord anymore. I've got to learn how to stand on my own two feet at some point, right? Not, a, not a newborn, but so independence or leaving is the first and continuing price of ongoing life. And I love John 5, 19. You know, it's one of those verses you probably want to memorize. Jesus answered and said, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. Full stop. Right there. There you go. Want an example for life? There you go. I only do what I see my father doing. And another verse says, I say what I hear him saying. 
What a model. Memorize scripture. Don't be legalistic about it. Ask for the oil of the Lord to help you know how to use it. You could have a whole arsenal of scriptures to condemn people, right? You could take it out of context. No, it's in there as a tool to be used. Like a good chef can use different ingredients to come up with a different meal, right? As you memorize scripture and you're putting it in there and you have disciplines in your life, you now can serve the appropriate meal to the right person using the tools he gives you, okay? That's not religious. That's not legalistic. Why? For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, come on, even so, say it, the Son gives life to whom he will. How many of us need his life? All of us should put our hands up because there's some areas where we've slipped back and not even slipped back. Life dealt us a hand, and we didn't get the full Monty, you know, we didn't get all the tools that we should have been given, but it's not too late. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Smile. Humor me. <laughs> Here's where it gets tough. This is Joyce Myers. If we were abused physically or emotionally as children, we will have foundation stones of fear, rejection, anger, and a thousand variations. There's one part in her testimony where she says, there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't live in fear of my father coming into my bedroom. And... I don't have to fill in the rest of that story, right? And yet, look at her now. Amazing how God turned that whole situation around and used the negative things that happened to her for the good of other people because she has authority over sexual abuse because God freed her from the bondage of that, and now she can speak into it in a way that you and I might not if we didn't go through that thing and, and gain victory over it. We will need to have basic trust restored in us before the Father can reach out with confidence I'm sorry, before we can reach out to Father God or to any authority figure. So you can, you can like block it and pretend you don't need to do this, but, but what, what they're saying, and I agree with, is you have to have it restored. And faith and trust in the Bible is really like interchangeable, two interchangeable words. We hear faith more, but, you know, the first faith church of this or that, you don't hear the first trust church, sounds like a bank, right? But they're the same thing. Right? You're just trusting that I can, I can build my house on this rock. It's not sinking sand. This is a firm foundation of Jesus Christ. And do I fully understand every single thing? No. It's by faith. But I trust him. That's what we need. So these two words, incorporation and individuation. Okay? I don't want to get technical on you. If I could just use plain English, learning something's no good if you don't incorporate it. Right? I have to take the principles of the Word of God and then figure out how that works in my life versus how you do it in yours because we have different worlds that we live in. And then to individuate is basically to graduate and reach the level now where I can stand on those two feet and I can get the keys to a car and drive it without crashing, you know, or every other version of whatever it looks like to know that somebody's able to make good decisions on their own uh, as opposed to needing to keep checking back with you. Okay, I'm going to try to speed up a little because I see what time it is. Let's go to A Baby Remains. Can you get to that one? Okay, good. Uh, organically dependent for food, warmth, cleansing for every life-sustaining function. He could do nothing for himself except to eat, breathe, sleep, and eliminate. <laughs> it's a nice way to say it, huh? Each lesson learned is a step towards independence, including no more breastfeeding, right? And moving off that to a bottle. Uh, toilet training, walking, talking. Dressing, accomplishing courtesy, manners, customs, like all these things that we take for granted, they're just a normal part of life. They're going to be learned. They can either be learned the right way, God's way, with, with good discipline along the way, or the street will teach us. But we will get taught. And, and that might be some of the things we have to go back to and realize, wow, there's a crooked way in my life. But God said he'll make the crooked way straight, right? And it's not always evident that it was so crooked because if your whole family's doing it, they become black belts in this thing. And it's like, I didn't know there was another way to do it besides the way my family did it. They were all so good at it, whatever the it is. But if it's not God's way, then there's probably a better, no, not probably, definitely a better way. Uh, I like this last line. It says, teenage individu individuation sorry, and internalization cut some invis invisible umbilical cords, but what? See, okay, so that's back to the unhealthy relationship with the parents when you get married. 
that's what he's referring to here in the leave and cleave part. And, and if we're just honest, there's almost 8 billion people on the planet right now. Most of them are going to get married and have children, okay? Not every single person does, but this, this will be around long after we're gone, right? The idea, no matter what culture you're in, anywhere in the world, this is a human thing that people will want to get married and have a family. It's a beautiful thing. But do we get a lot of good training you know, in the school system? No. I, I didn't. I don't know about you all, but I sure did it. So it's one of the most important things that we know everyone's going to do, but we have to be politically correct because we can't do this. We can't say that. It might sound like a religious thing. Okay, so let's not say anything <laughs> about one of the most important things you'll ever do. Right? Can't be right, can it? So if there's an area, now it's really tricky, right? Because when you talk about marriage and leaving and cleaving, and the Bible says, honor your mother and father that life may go well with you. So you want to err on the side of not being disrespectful to them. But you need to say, no, like, this is what I believe. The Bible says I'm supposed to leave and cleave to my spouse. And I, and I want to have a great relationship with you. But if I feel like you're crossing a boundary line, I need to tell you. And that's not disrespectful. That's just me being honest. And, and your parents might need to hear that, right? Because if you're the oldest child and you're the first one that got married, they haven't been taught well how to do this either. No, not, not all, but... You know, some might still need a little assistance. <laughs> and that's the part on the bottom where it says, not all of those invisible umbilical cords. What a picture that is, right? Where there could still be some soul tie that's not healthy between people that are supposed to sever the tie and say, okay, I'm going to allow you to leave and cleave, and now I'm going to respect you as two adults, as that sovereign new family unit, and I'm going to be an assistance to you. I'm not going to diminish it in any way by smothering you. And in, in some ways, that's the Romeo and Juliet story too, right? It's like the parents can give advice, but they don't have the right to control the whole thing. And I do a, quite a bit of marriage counseling, and I won't go into any personal details, but there's a lot of families that have multiple stepbrothers, stepsisters, different people coming to the wedding, and animosity between ex-spouses and, and all the things that could happen when that happens. And it's like, look, this is your day, I'm saying to the couple. We love and respect all of them, but you don't want to get hijacked on the most, one, it should be really the most important day of your life, other than getting saved. And just because they're having a hard time, you're not going to let it ruin your day, okay? Don't, don't get caught up in that drama. I had a boss that said, leave the drama to your mama. <laughs> it's a good one, isn't it? All right, let's keep going. <laughs> I want to jump ahead to imprinting, okay, Marissa? See that little graph there? All right, so on the other side of the chart, you have another article here. And this is a little bit of a lead up to next week, which is called Identifications of Love. And there's a bridge between basic trust and identifications of love. And I'll try to make that clear. Um, but Sometimes you're just going through your normal course of life and you're reading the news. I have to do that for my job. I have to know what's going on in the economy and the stock market and, and politics. So sometimes as you're reading the general news, you'll see something and it'll spark something in you to say, even though it's a secular newspaper, it's a kingdom principle that, that we understand. And that's what happened to me when I was reading this one day. And I'll, I'll just go through the article quickly with you. It says, a sport plane taking birds to Florida is grounded, okay? Now, it sounds funny that a plane would be taking birds, doesn't it? So that's the first thing that gets your, your interest. But what happened is these certain kind of whooping cranes started to become extinct. So the migration patterns were getting lost. There wasn't enough of them. So we're, they were taking the young chicks and taking the eggs. They were hack, hatching them, and then they were doing the things that they needed to do to convince these birds that they were the mother. Okay, that's, that's what some of these pictures will show you. Ten young whooping cranes and the bird-like plane that they think is their mother are flying to their winter home in Florida, okay? And I, can you see that first picture on the left at the top there? That's the birds chasing after this plane that they think is the mother, okay? And it says Operation Migration is a part of whatever. You don't have to read all that. The grounded birds are part of this organization. You don't have to read that paragraph, but then get to the one where it says the birds are bred and hatched in this wildlife research center, and a small group of conservationists in baggy 
Bird suits conceal their human features. They're the first thing the birds see when they begin pecking away with their, out of their shell. So the one in the middle there, that bird's obviously older, but can you see how the guy looks like a bird? And he's feeding the little defenseless young crane, right? Now think about this spiritually and think about how the devil cloaks himself as an angel of light. And if we're defenseless because we haven't bonded to the right thing, we bonded to the wrong thing, and then we become, uh, we get under attack and don't have any tools to defend ourselves, right? Huge tool of the enemy to cloak himself as an angel of light. And you will bond with something. And in this case, these birds, this is the first thing they saw when they came out of the egg that fed them. So they're automatically imprinting. That's the word. They're imprinting that as their source of life. Otherwise, without somebody feeding me, I die. So I need this person. And that's what these lies do to us. When we get a counterfeit version, we start depending on lies and, and not being able to separate out the truth. So it doesn't just happen with birds and planes. You can see that dog, these little ducks following the dog. He was the first thing that they saw. So they're following him like it's their mother. And then on the bottom, you see that German shepherd. And you see all those little ducklings following after the dog because that's who they thought was their mother. And it's really sad that this is how life can be for some of us. Because if we didn't get what we should have had, we're going to imprint to something. And that becomes a false identification of love. If Joyce Meyer had done that, she would have expected her husband to rape their children, just to show you how crazy that would be, right? But if you grew up with violence in the home, you might think that the way love gets expressed is for a man to be violent to a woman. It sounds so illogical if you didn't grow up there, but if that's what was imprinted, that has to be unwound, not fixed. <laughs> it's got to be deconstructed and a new, new resurrected person comes out on the other side of that with Christ as the image. Okay, good? Make sense? Yeah. All right, I'll go to Proverbs 22. I'm sure a lot of you memorize this one coming up. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I love the way they wrote this. It says, we can depend on the Lord to build basic trust in us even when we have not acquired it as children. He's able to reach into our innermost being and fill us with his tender, enfolding love. The counselor can help to communicate God's unconditional love through gentle prayer and godly affection, okay? Sometimes all you have to do is just show up for people, be with them, listen, put an arm around the shoulder, give them good godly counsel out of the word, which most seasoned Christians would know just in the course of being a Christian. But being there for them and being available for them might be one of the first times I've ever had somebody who didn't have an agenda. So I'll tell you one story because we're winding down now. Um, it's from the Sanfords. They, they got recommended, they got many phone calls for people who needed help to get placed in a home because there might have been a father that went to jail for sexual abuse and the mother wasn't around and now this person needed a safe place to go where they would get asked if somebody was in jail and was thinking about re-entering, they had to have final say as the experts in the courtroom whether this person should be put back into the home. Think about that one. So one time they got a call, and it was a woman who had been in Romania as a missionary, and she was working with um, the orphanages over there. And it was right when war started to happen, and all of a sudden she had to leave the country because she wasn't safe as an American. And instead of getting to say goodbye to these kids who she had bonded with for so long as infants, she had to run out and just escape to save her life. And she got back to America and needed a place to be put, you know, a family that would take her in. And when she got to the first family, she couldn't even talk. All she could do was cry. There was no consoling her. They called the Sanfords back and said, I'm sorry, we can't keep her because nothing we're doing is working. So can you take her back and find another home? Second home, same thing. Third home, same thing. Gets to the fourth home, and these people decided to do what the Bible says. It says, weep with those who weep. Instead of trying to counsel her, they just cried with her. You know, it's really touching when you think about it. It's not that hard to do that, is it? If you allow yourself. That's what empathy is about. Get in the hole with the person. And all of a sudden, gradually, day after day, as they did that, it stopped, right? 
Not a very complicated solution, but nobody else thought to do that because it hurts to do that. It hurts to put yourself on the line like that with other people. It's like, let somebody else do that one. Maybe not. You know, maybe he's calling us to do it as part of that process of becoming more like him. The fluency of Christ. Paul said, I want to know you, the power of your resurrection, but also the fellowship of your sufferings. <laughs> did he have to put that in there? Thank you. He did. So that might be one of the fellowship of his sufferings. He's asking you to do th things that you feel are such a stretch. And yet the exact medicine, not just for that person that got healed, but for the one who cried with them to realize, I, I came up with a different way than what the normal way would have been. And who would think that God could use you crying as a way to heal somebody, right? But he's just way bigger than we could even think, right, or imagine. That sounds like a verse, doesn't it? All right, we're almost done. It says, if counselors, uh, see that one? If a counselor ministers in the nature of Jesus, this is such a beautiful list here, in the nature of Jesus, by the wisdom and power of Jesus, tuned in to his direction so as not to rape the process, whew, always aiming sensitively to connect the person being counseled to who? What's the temptation when you're counseling? Connect them to because you want to be the person who's the savior. Oh, not good, right? You're not connecting them to you. You're connecting them to Jesus. There's no wound beyond healing if we'll do those things. And no experience beyond redemption. We need only to always remember that the calling is to minister to the inner heart. And so the solely effective method is the cross. Now, let me tell you. So many things happen along the way just by being connected in the body of Christ. So many unpredictable things that just being together and coming together and, and being willing to just put your hand to the plow and say, you know what, I'll show up for children's ministry once a month. Those children will minister to you in ways you didn't expect. The parents will minister to you. You think you're there to help, and they're helping you. It's just this amazing switching and changing of roles that happen because it's the kingdom and it's being driven off of a an unselfish model that says we're all trying to help each other out whatever wherever you are in your journey I, i'm wherever i am on my journey by being together in it and using the lord's way of doing things we're, we'll all grow together doesn't mean we're perfect but it sure beats going to a bar every night i promise you that i did that long enough <laughs> all right I don't know if I'm going to do those. For, yeah, okay. I'll do these last three verses and we'll end. This is all part of a really important part of Scripture for me personally. It's from 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm using the tra uh, Passion Translation, and we'll end with these verses, okay? It says, you find God's favor by deciding to please God even when you endure hardships because of unjust suffering. All right? That's a bit of a mouthful, don't you think? You're suffering. You want the right to be right, but God is saying you might have to give up the right to be right in this situation because this situation is going to turn around, but by you not having to fight it every, every step of the way, tooth and nail, let the process happen here, right? You might have to wait before you respond. You get his favor even when you endure that hardship because of unjust suffering. For what merit is it to endure mistreatment for wrongdoing? Yet if you're mistreated when you do what's right and you faithfully endure it, this is commendable before God. That, that's hard to swallow, isn't it? I'm just supposed to take it? I'm, I'm not allowed to complain? What you're supposed to do is be like Jesus, okay? We're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. So did you ever see the movie Cool Hand Luke? Anybody out there? That, why was it so good? He allowed himself to be beaten up, but somehow in allowing himself to be beaten up, he won. It's amazing, right? It's such a biblical principle, but it doesn't mean it's easy to do. So that's all. Yes, you have a right to defend yourself. You're not supposed to be rolled over by a bulldozer, but pick the timing with God. There might be something about the process of unjust suffering that is actually going to be redemptive for the other person because that's going to bring conviction on them. All right? So verse 21, in fact, you were called to live this way. Boy, if I wasn't happy before, now I'm really unhappy. I'm called to suffer unjust treatment. 
Where's that in the job description? I'm called to this? This is normal? Like, oh, that can't be right. Because Christ also suffered in your place, leaving you his example for you to follow. So this might be you do join a ministry in church, and all of a sudden you're partnered up with somebody that you really don't like. There's a cognitive dissonance. You're, there's, a, there's a chemistry imbalance between the two of you. They may get along with somebody, but it's not you. <laughs> Maybe God is trying to teach you something about you through that person. Maybe. Just maybe, right? It's funny how we're all laughing because it's happened to all of us. And if you jump to a wrong conclusion initially, you should go back to that person. And that's out of the movie Hacksaw Ridge, right? The soldiers apologized to him. I had you all wrong. I thought you were weak for not wanting to carry a weapon. Now I realize you're the bravest guy in the whole division. Total turnaround. He endured hardship, but he made his point. And their lives changed. It's a powerful movie. All right, so called to live this way. And then 22 says, he never sinned. He never spoke deceitfully. That's just quoting Isaiah 53, 9. When he was verbally abused, he did not return with an insult. When he suffered, he would not threaten retaliation. Jesus faithfully entrusted himself into the hands of God who judges righteously. Help us, Lord. Help us not. It says in one version, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When they hurled insults at him, they did not hurl insults. He did not hurl insults back. What he did was commit it to his father, who he knew would judge justly. That takes an awful lot of discipline. That takes a, a humble spirit and, and a daily altar, frankly, in my life. Because if I'm not praying and reading and staying immersed in the word, it's so easy for the linebacker to come out. My inner linebacker. <laughs> And, and to use intimidation and all kinds of ugly things pop up, don't they? He, car he himself carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we would be dead to sin and live for righteousness. Here's it. We're, we're done now. Our instant healing flowed from his wounding. <laughs> Do you think that could happen through us? Somebody else could get healed because we didn't immediately react to the wounding they were giving us, but we showed some grace Mercy triumphed over judgment when they were expecting you to treat them just like anybody else would. They slapped you, but you didn't slap back. <laughs> you were like sheep that continually wandered away, but now you've returned to the true shepherd for your lives, the kind guardian who lovingly watches over your souls. Let's stand. I don't know how many people are here on the prayer ministry team, but if you are, please come up. I'll be there tonight. And... Uh, I gave you the basic trust uh, prayer last week. We finished with that, so there's not a prayer tonight for us to pray out loud together. But I would like to just ask you if you could just to lift your hands and let's just ask the Lord to seal what Holy Spirit did for us tonight. And seal and reveal, okay? That, you know, we seal it so that it doesn't leak back out, but then we say, Lord, reveal, because that's who you are. You're the revealer of secrets. Wherever we have cracks in our foundation, wherever there were stones that were broken in those early years of our lives that are many decades ago for some of us here, they may not come up in our memory of our mind, but they could come up in our spirit because that's who you are. You're the author of life. You know everything about us. So without us being you know, overly consumed with these things, we just ask you to be kind in the way you show us but please do reveal it to us so that we know what we should be looking at and where those leaks might have occurred in our lives and what needs to change so that we can be transformed into a more identical image of Jesus every day that we're alive. We say, Lord, you have free reign over our lives to reveal to us what needs to change and that we submit to your will so that your power will fill us in order to bring the changes that are necessary. In Jesus' name, amen. Appreciate you all. Please don't leave unless we have your email address so I can get you everything that you'll need. And um, thank you for coming, and we'll see you next week.